you know, I have a certain methodology I've adopted over the years. I'm a very system oriented person. So I tweak the system and it seems to have worked, but you know, really it's, it's kind of getting the operator engaged and, and understanding kind of how the theory works, right? How to demystify the box a bit. When I hit start, what happens? What's that noise? You know, and then moving on into control systems and how they operate. Rising above the ultrasonic cleaners and the clanking of stainless steel are the ideas and voices that are changing an industry. You're listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for people, processes and products that are improving our sterile processing world. Each week we speak with frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty every instrument, every time. Whether you're tuning in for education or inspiration, we're glad you did. Now turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go Beyond Clean. On this episode, we are speaking with Shane Pinkston, Commercial Operations Manager at Gettinga. We're going to be talking about steam sterilizers today, Hank. And as we kick off season 17, that's my lucky number, folks. This is my favorite season of Beyond Clean. Really excited to talk about that piece of equipment that everybody sees in every single department. And, you know, along with the washers, it's right there front and center. I'm super pumped about this theme as well, all about equipment for season 17. And yeah, what a bigger piece of equipment in our departments than the steam sterilizer over there in the corner. It's important to start here, I think, with the interviews for this season and to really highlight the importance and the challenges around ensuring that your steam sterilizer is working appropriately to start there. And then we're going to talk about all kinds of other great equipment like cart washers, ultrasonics, AERs, even all the way down to the lowly heat sealer. But we're going to cover all of that equipment in one season, and we're kicking it off with a fantastic interview here from Shane today. <laughs> the lowly heat sealer. All right. We're going to be right back after a short break with Shane Pinkston, Commercial Operations Manager at Gettinga. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Hank Walsh. From 17 Studios, you're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Shane Pinkston, Commercial Operations Manager at Gettinga. And Shane, really excited to talk to you today about steam sterilizers. And this is going to kick off. My favorite number, by the way, is 17. So this is season 17. And you're kicking it off with us. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invite, guys. Uh, very excited on my, on my side as well. This has actually been something we've, we've been in the works for a long time on and just happy to be a part of it and excited to talk about one of my passions. I know it might sound boring to some, but steam sterilization, right? Well, I'm excited for it. I want to maybe just introduce you to the audience. I know this is your first appearance on the Beyond Clean podcast. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and how you find yourself in the role you're in today? Well, thanks. Thanks for the intro. Yeah. So I've been in the space, oh, geez, dating myself back into 1994, left the military and was hired in the maintenance end of the business. I'm working on sterilizers, right? So working on them, installing them, managing projects, eventually moved on to the consumable side, sold the consumables piece of the business, managed that business for a short amount of time. During that time, I also was able to be involved with the Amy committee, which was very nice. It was right around the time that ST79 was was coming to life. So it was kind of an exciting time to be in. A lot of activity in the network with you know, various customers, various vendors. And it was really nice to see the joint collaboration between us. And then really moving on into that experience into planning and design of departments, selling instrument tracking. And then naturally, I guess the fit was, what have I not done? The operations side. So here I am today on the operations side, actually looking at the business, but having a a little bit different perspective on the market from the sales side to the operations side. 
So that's really been my career for the last, I guess, close to 30, 30 years now. Yeah, I just echo Justin, you know, welcome to the show. And in this conversation, obviously, when you think sterile processing, I think there there's probably one place in sterile processing that is like the epicenter, you know, potentially of the whole department. Everything is pointed to this sterilization phase. Like we talk a lot about cleaning for all the reasons that it's important and all the cliches. If it's not clean, it can't be sterile, you know, but at the end of the day, it's it's pointing to this step. It's pointing to this sterilization step and a large percentage of all the workflow is obviously coming through these steam sterilizers. So let's just get into the content. I know I've kind of set it up, but let's take a step back. And for those who are, you know, new to the space, potentially coming into the space as students, or even, you know, folks who have just kind of been working in the industry for decades and lost track of how special this piece of equipment is. Can you describe kind of high level what a steam sterilizer is, when and why it's needed in the sterile processing workflow? Absolutely, Hank. Really, the steam sterilizer is the it's the magic box, right, that's in the department. It's the one that makes funny noises from different times of day, depending upon you hitting start or maybe an alarm or something like that. But at the end of the day, it's the one that seems to have the most, I think, myth behind it because the door's closed. You don't get to see what's going on behind that door. And, you know, it's it's a pretty significant piece of equipment in the department. It's architecturally significant. It weighs a couple thousand pounds in some cases, you know. It takes up a considerable amount of space. Usually they have their own little room that they fit into, you know, that people mysteriously go into, you know, behind the door and, and fix them and they magically come back to life. Right. So, um, <laughs> it's, it's that, it's that box that we all want to know more about, but since we can't see in it, we don't know what it does. So I, I think demystifying kind of that process is, is going to be the fun part of today. Hmm. Yeah, you're right about the size of these things. If you've never seen them out of the wall or out of the department, we were a part of a construction project in Kentucky and I got to see the new sterilizers come in off the dock. And these are massive pieces of machinery. And even at that time, I think our department was on the second floor, you know, so there was questions on how we're going to get this from the dock to the department because it's not going to fit in the elevator. Well, what's the solution? I think they ended up, you know, putting it through the window with a crane on the outside. It was just something crazy like that. So that size alone, you know, to your point is very, it's a big deal. And it's a lot bigger, again, if you're just looking from the outside in the department, like you see the door, you see the chamber, there's a lot of things going on. So maybe let's start there. What are those other components like the chamber we're aware of, at least on the inside of the chamber, we see that and we see the user interfacing side with the dials and with the door. What else is going on behind that wall? Well, the, the behind the wall part is where all the magic really does happen. Hank, that's, that's where when you, when you hit start or you hit, hit a button on the control panel, it's sending a signal to the control and it's saying, Hey, here's what we have to do. Here's the program we have to execute. And by doing that, it's telling the valves what to do. So when you hear hissing and things like that, it's the pneumatics engaging on, on the valves to open or close. It's the steam coming into the chamber. It's water going down into the heat exchanger to collapse the steam that's actually coming out. Out, right, we can't have temperatures over 140 degrees in in the United States going down the drain. It won't meet code, so we have to quench that. We also have to quench that steam in, in order to collapse it as well. So all of those things are the things that are actually going on when you actually hit start. Not to mention the mysterious vacuum part of the cycle. Right, <laughs> right, right. And we may get into some of those technical <laughs> ones here later. I know we've done a couple of episodes around steam. I with Jonathan Wilder in the past, and he really like dug into the science part of that, you know, which it does. It gets extremely complex, extremely quickly, and it's, it's frankly over my head. I think for the most part, I'm just the button pusher like we were talking about before. But in terms of variations of equipment, they're not all created equal, like all steam sterilizers not created equal. And there's probably, I'm assuming, there are some standard variations or variables that you see 
in the U.S. market. So can you cover that in a typical hospital or, you know, typical ambulatory surgery center? Like what kind of steam sterilizers are we talking about or particular sizes or styles, et cetera? Absolutely. Yeah. So, Hank, there's there's literally dozens of different models and chamber lengths, chamber sizes, right? I think that's kind of the key. It's like you go into a dental clinic, you'll see tabletop autoclaves, right? They're, you know, they've been around forever. And then you go into a surgery center, you're, you're typically going to see something a bit smaller because really there's not as much space in a surgery center. I, I think a lot of times ASCs, especially in the past, the SPD portion was, was not thought out, right? They didn't see all of the things that are transitioning today with orthopedics moving and, and the need for bigger autoclaves. You know, you get into the, the hospital market and depending upon the size and, and procedure type, you could end up with a big walk-in type sterilizer, or you can end up with something in between, right? And then on top of that, in the OR, you're typically going to see your, your smaller IUSS sterilizer hiding somewhere in a corner. These used to be very prevalent, it used to be 20 or 30 of these sometimes in a, in an OR. And now you might be lucky to find one in a, you know, a large facility that has like 30 operating rooms. So on that comment about those IUSS sterilizers, I have seen a trend and I kind of want to get your perspective on if these operating rooms are not completely taking them out, which many of them are kind of decommissioning, et cetera. If they're not taking them out, they're actually converting those cycles into terminal cycles and then, you know, potentially running some small batch, small low terminal cycles in the operating room. Are you seeing that in the space or is there any other trends that's tied to that that you're seeing in the hospital space in particular? Really, I think what we're seeing, we're seeing a couple of things, really. I think people are taking a a bigger look at do they have the right size of equipment? And I'll get into this more later because I know we have some discussion points on it. But, you know, I think the premise back in the day was bigger is better. And, you know, now that we're seeing that the shortages in staff in SPD and, you know, the people that we do have, you know, they're being overworked, right? We, we know this. Having to do more with less really the bigger sterilizer can can really impact you in a in a negative way because you you tend to wait to fill it up right so we we see a trend in SPD where they're actually what i call right sizing the department and putting in units that still they may not have the capacity but they have the throughput and there's two differentiators right and then as far as the OR goes if they are going to have one of these up there, they tend to have maybe a, a room that does cleaning and sterilizing. So maybe it's a, a rapid turn piece or, or maybe it's a Da Vinci reprocessing up in the OR as opposed to down there. So I think those are things to look at as we, you know, as we move forward. At the end of the day, it's, it's trying to find the most efficient process and repeat it. Right. And get the quality out of it. So however that works in the OR or SPD is really where where these sterilizers should be looked at. I want to ask you if if you've gotten any of their pros or cons about those different varying sizes that you mentioned. You might have actually just covered that just now, too. But I also before that, I want to follow up on the comment about the Da Vinci. And actually, we just had this conversation on another topic on LinkedIn around sinks. It's a question about the length of our instrumentation. When I started in 2009 in sterile processing, really the longest instrumentation that you would see are for some of these like bariatric trays. We did have Da Vinci already in use in 2009, right? So like those trays are already there, but it was on a limited basis. But now we're seeing more and more and more of robotic instruments, a lot of bariatric procedures now growing and I'm just wondering if that's going to impact the chamber size, to your point, or at least the design of these carts, these loading carts that are being used. Have you had any conversations or been aware of that on the manufacturing side? Not not so much on the manufacturing side. I think there's ways to accommodate those because they typically are, are one-offs from your main production cycles. Your main production cycles, you can tend to have a bit larger autoclave. I would just caution too large, right, is not where you want to go because of those productivity impacts. And that's why there's there are so many links, right? It's determining that with your 
vendor consultant to determine what's the best fit. But the, the other piece that we see a trend in, and this has actually been a trend for a number of years now is to have, you know, a quick turn type of sterilizer that's maybe the same chamber width and height, but the depth is different, right? It's shorter. You're able to maybe accommodate those one offs. You still get production out of it. You save a little money because it's not as expensive to purchase and the benefits are the cycles faster right? Because it's a smaller chamber. So that's kind of what I've seen. I haven't seen any changes to the sterilizer makeup from device yet. Yeah. I can also see the benefit of having that quick turn one, having different cycle times programmed into it, you know, just for that unique circumstance. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about well, two things I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to start with scalability too, because you talked about different sizes and really right sizing the equipment for the department. But I also, how many departments end up having to do a full renovation because their caseload volumes have gone up so much that they can't meet the capacity. So if you're talking about right sizing it, is there a way that you can look at or make recommendations in terms of a reno or a new build with scalability in mind in terms of the design choices that they make that, hey, with the space that you have, if you go with this, ultimately long-term, you could increase your surgical volume and capacity by 20 to 30%. So, you know, you're not going to have to all of a sudden try to wedge another sterilizer in here in in five years. Absolutely, Justin. I I think, you know, most vendors have some capacity planning tool that you know, can effectively show based on what your current volume is and then also what your projections are, right? So if you know what you process, you know what your caseload mix is, so you kind of have an idea of what the sizes of those containers are, you can determine models and and need based on, on that. And then if there's a growth projection from the facility, that can also be plugged in, right? It's, it's really not complex math. It's, you know, number of trays per day, operating hours, right? It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's math. It's really math, right? So at the end of the day, if we have the math right, we can plan accordingly and tell you where your, your five year need may be and your 10 year need may be as well. So now I want to shift over to clinics and training because we just made this assumption that the capacities are going to increase in the you know, main hospitals or the larger hospitals, but we've also seen this shift, you know, towards ASCs. Now that's different than the tabletop sterilizer that we're talking about in the dental clinic, but we know that there's a huge area of just training, knowledge base, et cetera, not just on equipment, but just on the fundamentals of sterile processing as more and more of this work is done in that clinic non-acute setting. So as we kind of turn that back around a little bit is the design of these sterilizers for those clinic settings, maybe a little more simplified or easier to match the fact that sometimes those people are not trained sterile processing professionals and are wearing multiple hats. Like definitely I think about that in the dental clinics for sure, but that can sometimes happen in ASCs too, where you've got a surgical tech who also does sterile processing responsibilities and, and, you know, wearing those multiple hats, mostly for flexibility in there. Yeah, absolutely. I I think, you know, what we see in ASCs is really, it's, it's actually a bit more complex. We're space limited, right? Typically in hospital, you have, you know, you may be space limited in your department, but you have more space in the facility. An ASC, you're limited on space. And also the time factor, right? You are typically only open maybe 12 hours. So you have to figure out how to cram all of this productivity in a short amount of time and still do it right with, to your point, people that this might not be their primary profession. So, you know, with that, I think there, there needs to be a very consistent approach to training. You know, I have a certain methodology I've adopted over the years. I'm a very system oriented person. So I tweak the system and it seems to have worked, but you know, really it's, it's kind of getting the operator engaged and, and understanding kind of how the theory works, right? How to demystify the box a bit. When I hit start, what happens? What's that noise? You know, and then moving on into control systems and how they operate, actually making operators do something, I think is, is the most engaging part. And then keeping that 
that sample size down of people that you're in servicing to a small enough group, I'd say four to five max. My experience has been you get groups over that and people don't pay attention and, you know, you end up with more distractions and you don't really accomplish anything. So really that more one to one focus as much as possible and then spending the time making sure they're aware and comfortable. And, you know, the other piece is reading the printout. Everybody's printouts a bit different. You know, you have one vendor that's read in a certain way, and then you have other manufacturers from other companies or that are overseas that have, have prints, printouts in a certain fashion. So it's a language barrier, right? We call something a bit different than one of our competitors does. So it's kind of understanding that terminology that they may have been used to through the years, right? Along with loading techniques, right? Uh, how do you load the sterilizer? How, you know, what are the watch outs? Those are the, the things that I think we fo- have to focus on with everybody. But with the ASC, we have to really spend the time there because they're not the expert hmm. per se. I would also think, well, I want to highlight something you just said first, which was the size of the group. You know, a lot of times when you're doing like a CE approved type of presentation and you're coming in as a vendor, you really want as many people there as possible, right? You're trying to educate everybody and you go in and you try to get the entire night shift. But I think... What you're describing is really a, an excellent best practice to keep in mind. It's not just simply meeting the obligation of saying we just installed this so everybody needs to know how to use it and trying to do that as quickly as possible. It's about making it an effective training and the group is small enough. I would say probably for the biggest reason is to allow for them to ask questions because when people ask questions, that's when they take accountability for the information that you're giving them. And it's how they assimilate it kind of into the way that they think and the way that they perceive. And I would think another thing you might be trying to do too is anything that would wind up causing an issue with the load that you're really trying to be like, hey, these are the things that are going to end up causing you to have to run the load again. And it's the last thing that you want to do, especially as things get busy. And as we already said, oftentimes understaffed. Is that Like, what are some of those tips when you're doing an in-service? What are some things you tell them? Like, this is how you can avoid, you know, rework. Well, one, don't overload your sterilizer beyond what it can do, right? I think the key is is ensuring that you have enough room around your goods for steam penetration. So I I typically teach the the two-finger rule, right? If you can put two fingers between a pack and another pack, you probably have enough room. If they're much tighter than that, you might risk penetration into the load. So I think, I think that's a big piece of it. I think, you know, human nature is, you know, that we want to cram as much stuff as humanly possible into something. I I, I make the analogy of the dishwasher at home where somebody's trying to cram something on top of a plate and invariably something doesn't come out clean, right? So how is that any different in a sterilizer with steam penetration, right? It's kind of the same concept. If you If you don't have access to the point, how do you kill the microorganism that may be there? You know, I think you already talked through this, maybe not in this best practices sort of conversation exactly, but, you know, there's obviously considerations for design and installation, and there's some best practices there. I think you touched on a few of them, but is there anything that you like think really should be added in that area of it? Because I know so many, this is an area that for a lot of department leaders, they've never been through a reno or they've never been through, you know, a new build. They've never gone through that. And so, I think they're intimidated by the process because they don't want to make a decision that ultimately puts them in a bad position later. And at the same time, it also requires them to put a lot of trust and faith in the people that are giving them information. So any any tips or best practices around design and install? I would say primarily, don't be afraid to question if you know, just simply replacing something and putting it in the same hole per se is the best way to do it, right? Look at, look at the renovation potential from an efficiency and workflow standpoint to enhance your department. It may be the only time you get that. And I'm not saying you're going to win that battle every time with the facility that you work in. But at the end of the day, if you can prove that there's some operational inefficiencies where you're at and you can simply adjust that by maneuvering a sterilizer in a different 
you know, position or something like that, a different location in the department that isn't going to be overly costly. I think that's the challenge, right? This is your one shot, right? You, you said it, Justin, these, these folks, they don't always get a chance to do this during their career. Your vendors do this every day, right? This is what your vendors do. So utilize your vendor resources, their project management functions, their planning and design folks. They're outstanding at what they do and they should be able to help you with that, that piece of the puzzle to put, I guess, all of the pieces of the puzzle together so you can submit your budget plan for, for getting this approved, right? They can even help you with the approval process part of it. So that would be my suggestion mainly. And you brought this up earlier, Shane. I feel like there's, there's a bit of a renaissance going on in terms of the sterile processing leaders in these departments and these ASC leaders, like finally getting the resources, the internal resources and the training to be able to add insight in these renovation decisions, in these new constructions, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, maybe there were some of us who could do that. Now there's more and more who are thinking in like that lean methodology, like how can we make this the most efficient layout possible instead of an afterthought that's still in the ASC space, even the new constructions were like, okay, you know, it's 2022, we should have this together now, architects. But in this conversation, right, it is, it's a great opportunity now for us to leverage this new training and insight that the industry is kind of coming together with and not just repeat the same mistake with a new piece of equipment, you know, to your point. So I think that was a great highlight. We love to ask questions on Beyond Clean and kind of surface the, hey, did you know or or did you assume and maybe assumed incorrectly kind of thing. So I want to ask you if you can give us three things about sterile processing steam sterilizers that folks may not know or may have known before and have forgotten. So what would be those three things? Well, I think at least number one for me is bigger is not always better. Right. I think I've addressed this before. It's understanding the impact of what that large sterilizer can do to your department. If you don't need it, you know, don't buy it. Buy the right size equipment for your operation. Right. That's, that's kind of my number one. And if anybody needs help with that, please reach out to your vendors. They're happy to help you. Right. Understand what the right size product is. Trying to think of beyond that. Really, it's, I think there's a conception that, you know, when the cycle's complete, everything is sterile, right? I, I always tell people this in an in-service, you are smarter than the machine is, right? If you didn't select the right cycle, the machine's going to run it regardless, right? So ensuring that those those pieces are, you know, really the quality assurance pieces adhered to is a big part of it. I'm trying to think of a third one. I might need your help on that one <laughs> to jog my memory. Well, so. it might be a myth which is what my next question is. So in those misconceptions, you kind of mentioned the bigger is better is a common misconception. I think you also alluded to that tendency to just replace in the whole of that piece of equipment and not be thinking kind of that second level, hey, can I actually improve this process now? But yeah, when you're doing in-services or taking calls from customers and maybe even outside of SPD, like are there any misconceptions that you run into from facilities, from uh, OR yes. uh, directors sometimes <laughs> that you want to mention here? <laughs> One would be my steam quality is outstanding. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, that's always the facilities folks' favorite. They think that their steam plant produces the best steam possible. Yet I look at the inside of their sterilizer and it's purple, blue, orange, yellow, black, that's all contaminants from their system, right? So if it's that good, why do we get the funky smell? Why do we, why do we get the staining, right? Why do we get our favorite term, wet packs, right? Most of the time, I hate to tell you, it's not your sterilizer. It's the, uh, it's the steam system ahead of it. So I think that's kind of the big one. The other one is, and this is my hot topic is an alarm is actually your friend. The alarm on the sterilizer is not a bad thing. The alarm actually prevents us from being dumb, right? It's telling us that something's not right. It doesn't mean your machine's broken. It just means something's going on that you need to look at, right? And that's where I go back to the adage of you are smarter than your machine. So 
you know, learn what the alarms are. They're not always your, your autoclave's fault, right? They could be a byproduct of facilities, water pressure, your steam system went down. It's really preventing you from hurting a patient at the end, right? It's, it's not going to let something go through that hasn't met that sterilization criteria that's built into the program. So you nailed it with the, our steam is perfect. And I feel like that's such a blind spot for so many managers is like, how do I coach my facilities team to look for the things that are going on here? And I feel like it's an industry knowledge gap that there could be some real focused education on is because a lot of times we just say, ah, we're going to leave this to ASHRAE and send it on over to plan ops. And I feel like empowering some of our department leaders to at least have some simple troubleshooting sort of conversations, you know, for that to set the table and build some credibility would help the vendors. Because what happens when you have the vendors and the plan ops going back and forth with no real reference is you wind up in this really silly battle and, and it's not us. It's you. No, it's not us. We're telling you it's you. And, and I feel like having a department manager that's a little bit more knowledgeable and adept at sort of seeing that for what it is and navigating it and helping facilitate, you know, a true process improvement and resolution would really help move some of those scenarios along. Cause the situation you described, I, I've gotten, I've had at least five conversations since the start of this year where people have told me about that scenario. Oh, that I believe, Justin. I, I I think we hear it quite commonly, especially when we go into facilities. We see it all the time. And you're also paying more money to clean your chambers, right? If, if you have a, had a better steam quality, you wouldn't be having to clean your chambers as often per se, right? Which is a, which is a fee that's a, a yearly fee, right? It could be a quarterly fee depending upon how bad your quality is. And then also, if we don't think that's effect, affecting instrument quality, you know, we're mistaken, right? So anything that's being deposited on the chamber is going on the instrument as well. If you see it on the jacket, it's on your instruments. You can count on it. It's just slow rolling. All right, last question. We You can't believe how fast these interviews go, Shane. But like, if you were to look ahead to the next five or 10 years, what kinds of innovation, changes, process adjustments, or just industry trends? And, and I'm kind of hearing that right-sizing is a new trend. So what are some other emerging trends that you think might play out over the next five to 10 years in steam sterilization? Well, I mean, I think we've seen the trend start, you know, it started probably seven to 10 years ago. Clean steam has become a a hot topic, right? Because of all the things that we just talked about, the staining issues, the being able to control your own with an internal generator that's more of a clean product delivers a better clinical outcome, right? We, I think we're going to see more prevalence in that arena, whether it's with internal generators on your sterilizers or whether it's with some external type of generator that's capable of producing a better quality steam that's separate from the facility steam. I think you're going to see automation systems advance, especially with the trend now. People are moving more to vertical sliding door sterilizers or horizontal sliding door sterilizers. They're more readily accessible for automation, right? We talked doing more with less. Well, you know, in order to supplement staff, how do we supplement and take some of that workload off? We automate. So is it AGV robots? Is it loading and unloading stations that are dedicated? I think there's a number of, of things that are being advanced in that arena. And we see it globally, it tends to be more globally introduced before it comes to the U.S. And I think that's simply because of the, a lot of the regulations that we have to deal with. Enhanced connectivity, I think, is going to be a big key. I think you see it probably at HSPA from every vendor. There's a twist on on connectivity and what that means for, you know, outputs to instrument tracking systems or remote diagnostics and analytics, essentially improvements of uptime. And then, you know, from our standpoint, it's an increased focus on sustainability. The new machines are much more efficient with utilities, but I think there's also room for improvement with every vendor on that to look at. So those would be probably my top four in the next five to 10 years that I think we'll we'll really see come to fruition. Yeah, I kind of heard that interoperability woven in there as well, right? Is like, how do we connect all these data points, even though it might not be, you know, one single manufacturer's solutions and, and pulling that all the way through. So 
Great job, Shane. Really enjoyed having you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Hank. I appreciate it. Love to come back. That was Shane Pinkston, Commercial Operations Manager at Geninga. We're talking about steam sterilizers today, Hank. And I thought there were some really good best practices in there. The biggest takeaway for me was the right-sizing conversation. The bigger is better debunking that myth, I think, on this episode. But I always have a great interest in sort of these areas of opportunity, too, and those outpatient or non acute clinic settings. I know there's a huge opportunity in the dental space for sure, but even as we move more and more of these procedures to ASCs and people wearing multiple hats, and when he talked about that training being a smaller group training, having done a lot of education as a vendor, usually you're taught as many people as possible, don't leave anybody out. And I think this is such a critical piece of equipment that being a little bit smaller group training and really being able to spend some time with the staff is critical. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say, Justin. So um, let's just close this episode. <laughs> I <was> gonna... <laughs> this time, I'm, I preemptively stole your thunder. You didn't I was even know. Gonna talk about the training piece. Um, yeah, it was for me, the big takeaway was that training emphasis because our turnover, like we've done various episodes, right? level of turnover in sterile processing is through the roof. Got a lot of new folks coming in all the time. It is and would be impossible for any manufacturer, no matter the size of their team, to keep up with every new person, ensuring that before they start using this equipment, they get that same in-service that the rest of their peers did, you know, six months ago. And I know we didn't get into it on this episode, but this is why I'm such a huge fan on digital and virtual education, primarily from manufacturers and primarily product focused, because the only way to ensure that everyone has access 24-7 to learning how to do this properly, depending on the variable equipment that you have, you got to have that 24-7 access to ongoing online education I hope folks who are listening to this that create these theme sterilizers take that into account. Okay, well, that's going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you very much, Shane, for joining us. And as a reminder, you can support Beyond Clean just by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcast. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or Spotify. And if you've got a favorite podcast application that you like better than those, just simply search for Beyond Clean Podcast. You can also access bonus content, but we only have that bonus content available for those of you that have downloaded our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. So definitely want to encourage you to do that. And while you're there in the App Store, give us a rating and a review because we love seeing that feedback that you like what we're putting out on the app. If you have any topics or just general feedback for the show, send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank and myself, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Beyond Clean. Beyond Clean.